Good morning, Covenant College. I have to say I am excited about this morning. Back in the first half of the 1990s, Tabitha and I lived in married housing apartments at Wheaton College. Don't get any ideas, you guys. Some of you will figure that out after a while. Three or four doors down from where we lived was this incredibly thoughtful, fun, and vibrant couple named Mark and Lori Yarhouse. Meals, occasional holidays, and plenty of laughter and conversation were shared. Mark at the time was finishing his doctorate in psychology, and even at that point it was clear he was a gift to the church and the academy. What's wonderful, decades later, is when you have a friend and you think, this person is absolutely incredible, and then you get to see others discover it. So I want to tell you a little bit about him. He has degrees in philosophy, theology, and clinical psychology. And in a place like Covenant, we can realize just how uniquely situated that allows him to speak into complex and difficult issues. Now, Dr. Yarhouse is the Rosemary Scotty Hughes Professor of Christian Thought and Mental Health Practices at Regent University in Virginia Beach. He's a recipient of the Chancellor's Award for Excellence for Research, Service, and Teaching at Regent. He's the founder of the Institute for the Study of Sexual Identity, and he serves on the editorial board for the Journal of Psychology and Theology. I could list all of the books he's authored, co-authored, and edited. He's written many, but what, what would be of interest to you is not merely he has written very high-level work for the academy, but he's actually written quite a bit also for the people of God, for the church, um, on some of these very difficult issues. He's focused his research and writing on family therapy, psychopathology, sex therapy, and sexual identity. And his most recent work, which uh, yet again has captured quite a bit of attention, is called Understanding Gender Dysphoria, Navigating Transgender Issues in a Changing Culture, which you will be talking about this morning. Personally, as I was trying to think, what, what's the one thing I would like you to know about Mark and that I so appreciate appreciate about him and his scholarship, it is this. He listens well. He listens well to his clients. He listens honestly to research. He listens well to concerned parents and clergy and laity. But also, most importantly, he listens well to scripture that enables him to navigate these issues with compassion and integrity and honesty and carefulness. I hope you can tell I'm excited. Please join me in welcoming Mark Yarhouse. Well, thank you, uh, Kelly. That's a uh a really nice introduction, and it is a pleasure to be here, to be back. I was here several years ago, but to be in your community. Um, I was talking to a colleague one time. Um, for about 18 years, I've been doing research on people navigating same-sex sexuality in light of their faith and just the challenges that they face. And, um, you know, academics kind of, they cross each other in the hallway, and they ask, you know, hey, what are you working on? And so... <laughs> One of my friends asked me a couple of years ago, and I said, yeah, I'm working on a book, actually, on um, gender dysphoria, you know, transgender issues. This is a good friend of mine, so he loves me, prays for me, uh, doesn't really know the topic, and so he says to me, um, oh, that'll be nice to kind of get out of the whole controversies of gay and lesbian issues. Whew, I bet that'll be a relief. And <laughs> I, yeah, uh, okay, I guess... Um, more of a out of the frying pan into the fire, I guess. But if I thought gay and lesbian issues was controversial, transgender research in areas that has been really challenging to think through as a believer. So I want to just talk with you a little bit about that this morning. Um, I was speaking just last summer with a, an evangelical person who's a seminary-educated seminary graduate, 
she's um, biologically, you know, she's female, and she does present as female in uh, her gender identity, but she does suffer from gender dysphoria, okay? And gender dysphoria is when you feel great distress when your gender identity, your experience of yourself as a male or female, doesn't, isn't congruent with your biological sex. And so there's a disconnect there, incongruence, and it's greatly distressing. And so I was interviewing this person for an uh, article I was working on, and she said to me, the secular answer is to transition. The Christian answer is to receive healing and ministry. The reality for the majority of us is that we live with this every day, and it's painful. And I think she's got it exactly right. That's exactly where I would say the data is as well. Um, so I'm speaking to a Christian audience. What does that mean for us? What are the challenges for us when maybe our default is to push people towards healing and ministry when they're telling us that doesn't always deliver the goods? What are the challenges that we're going to face? I often ask people when I meet with them who are suffering from this, what is it like for you? Because most people would never feel this. And one friend of mine um, says of it, uh, I don't know if you've ever um, seen uh, maybe in movies people trying to listen to an old-time radio program where there'd be this background noise. You could sort of hear the program, but there's this constant noise in the background. That was the quality we used to deal with, um, with um, listening for entertainment purposes. But anyway, uh, this one friend said, it's the hiss, it's the hiss. Gender dysphoria is the hiss of an old-time radio, a sound which can be ignored with some effort in order to hear the broadcast, but cannot be extinguished without pulling the plug. Another person I interviewed said, it's like puzzle pieces that don't fit together. Have you ever done a jigsaw puzzle and you, you're, you're just trying to wedge one piece into another, and you realize it doesn't fit, but you're not dissuaded. You're going to just shove that piece in there anyway. This person said to me, it's just like that all the time. Another person I interviewed for a consultation with his family, they were a musical family, and, and um, the teenager said, it's like dissonance in music theory. It's a tonal combination that's always seeking resolution, except for gender dysphoria, it never resolves. It constantly feels like that. Now, we don't know the cause of this. Um, it's a very rare condition for people to experience this. Um, I never thought I would be writing about it or talking about it in chapel. It's just such a rare phenomenon. Um, probably the most popular theory is related to what's called the brain sex theory. Just the idea that during fetal development, testosterone in utero leads to the development of external male genitalia and to a male differentiated brain. And so one our, our theory is, does that happen at two different, it happens at two different stages of development. So one theory is maybe the genitalia map one direction, the brain maps the other direction in rare instances, whereas the vast majority of cases they map in the same way. And that's kind of an interesting, uh, probably weren't expecting to hear that in chapel, but it's kind of an interesting uh, theory. It doesn't have a tremendous amount of scientific support, but it's kind of one of these unifying theories that a lot of people are drawn to because it is... Uh, kind of looks at nature versus nurture. Other factors from the environment have included family relationships, the desire to have a child of the other sex, and then you don't have that, um, being very supportive and permissive of atypical gender behavior, some histories of, of abuse. Um, but I would say in the majority of cases, um, this begins at a very young age, between ages two and four, when, when, you're, when most of you, your gender identity developed between two and four, when you realized you're a boy or you're a girl, and your sense of that, this is what this is like for these folks. It's not that same experience that most of us have. So there's not, I would not frame this for the church as willful disobedience. This is, a, I found myself with this gender identity at a very young age, and they really don't know anything's of, um, off unless somebody tells them that's not the way girls behave or that's not the way boys are or, you know, and, and there's a bit of the, 
people around them saying, A, I hope this is a phase they'll grow out of, or B, um, this is cute within our family, but once they reach kindergarten or preschool, we're going to send them to see somebody because this is not, we don't know what, what's going on here. So that's kind of what that ends up looking like. Um, in my view as a psychologist, I'm open to the research here. I really don't have a position on causation. I just think that it's wise to walk with humility what we know and what we don't know. Um, so when I was trying to figure out uh, all of this, I guess I was impressed by the sheer exposure to the topic from media and entertainment. Because when most people think about transgender presentations, we think about reality shows like I Am Kate or I Am Jazz um, because this seminary graduate that I mentioned to you, she's not going to get a reality show. Somebody who is kind of trying to figure this out and kind of living in this space. Um, most of what you see in popular culture are people who adopt a cross-gender identity and they celebrate that and it kind of be becomes an entertainment presentation. And I'm not standing here being particularly critical of that. I'm just saying that that's such a rare resolution. It's not the most common way people kind of navigate this terrain that it would be probably misleading to a group this size to think that's what everybody's doing. That's what some people do. Other people, like sh this person shared with me, said that's the, the secular, in her, her mind, the secular answer is that everybody needs to transition. The Christian answer, everybody needs to get healing. And the reality is we live with it every day. We live with suffering. We live with in the time between the times. So when I was working on this project, I tried to organize how everybody was reacting to this science and theology and um, the people navigating this. I started to organize it in three lenses. So I'm just going to share those with you. And they're the lenses of integrity and disability and diversity. And I used the words that the people who were the proponents of that view used. So I'm not saying like when I describe integrity that the other two don't have integrity. I'm just saying this was the language of the proponent. And so the integrity lens really looks at gender dysphoria as um, when someone tries to resolve it through any kind of a cross-gender identification they're really confusing the essential maleness and essential femaleness that was intended by God from creation. And so for evangelicals, this is kind of the theological background for this, is that evangelicals typically believe that from creation, God made male and female, and that there's kind of laying out the parameters of what would be morally permissible in terms of sexual behavior. And then you could extend that to a discussion of gender identity and how you resolve this conflict, um, you'd be concerned then about cross-gender identification for some of the same reasons. So I'm quoting here in part an evangelical theologian who talks about this, um, about there being an essential maleness and an essential femaleness that is intended to be brought together from creation. So when you extend that to transsexuality, transsexuality is when you adopt a cross-gender identity, usually through medical procedures like hormonal treatment or surgeries, the theological concern then rests in the, quote, denial of the integrity of one's own sex and an overt attempt at marring the sacred image of maleness or femaleness formed by God. And so um, proponents of this view would also cite passages like from Deuteronomy, maybe talking about um, the emasculated or talking about cross-dressing and forbidding cross-dressing behavior. It was interesting, in, in 2000, uh, the Evangelical Alliance Policy Commission wrote a really little booklet on transsexuality, and they grappled with those passages. And what they say is that it was likely, just in keeping with God's covenantal purposes, to preserve the covenant community of Israel, that they would avoid anything that would threaten their existence and harmony. And so those cross-dressing prohibitions in Deuteronomy were introduced likely just to prevent involvement in contemporary Canaanite religious rituals of the day, which did involve swapping of sex roles and cross-dressing. Now one thing I would say is I think it would be a mistake to think of gender dysphoric people as cross-dressing for the same motivations that you see in passages like that in Deuteronomy, where it was clearly making yourself effeminate as a male 
to lure suitors to have sex with you. So there are reasons for those prohibitions. Gender dysphoric people are distressed by this experience of disconnection between their biological sex and their gender identity. They're not cross-dressing for sexual purposes. They're trying to manage the dysphoria. And that's at least worth asking as Christians, does motivation matter? Does how you're sort of wrestling with this, does that matter? Um, and there's just not that many passages in Scripture that explicitly address this, certainly not compared to the, I think what I think is clearer teaching around same-sex behavior. So when I grapple with this as a Christian, I grapple with this in terms of the four acts of the biblical drama, right? Creation, the fall, redemption, and glorification. And I think this integrity lens is strong on creation, God's creational intent. I don't know that the proponents that I see there are as strong on appreciating the fall and how it affects people and what that looks like in their day-to-day -day life and then what will pastoral care and shepherding people look like. A second lens is a lens of disability. And so this idea would be that gender dysphoria um, is a variation that occurs in nature. It's very rare, but it's not the proper functioning that you should see a, a normally a congruence between biological sex and gender identity. And so in rare instances when that doesn't happen, it's a variation that occurs in nature. And in that sense, it's a non-moral reality. It's, it, it's not that the person's choosing this, it's not willful disobedience, but they find themselves with this like any other sort of medical condition or psychological condition, you sort of say, okay, we should respond with greater compassion. Um, so Christians who are drawn to this lens will probably say that those occurrences, though rare, are the result of a fallen world in which we live. So yes, in the four acts of the biblical drama, creation matters. There's the way things were supposed to be, and there's the way things are not the way they're supposed to be. But this group is probably stronger on the impact of the fall, on gender identity, this incongruence, and the struggle that people have. And I hear more compassion from this group. We're still left with the question of redemption and glorification and what that looks like in the in-between times. But the third lens is the lens of diversity. And this is where the broader culture is rapidly moving towards. My field is there. Um, other branches of the academy are there, but this is the group that would say these differences, gender incongruence, really reflect, reflects a type of person to be celebrated, that you're part, if you're gender dysphoric, you're part of the broader transgender community, and we are a community to be celebrated. We're a culture of people, part of the broader LGBTQ community to be celebrated. And um, I think there's sort of two groups in this camp. There are groups who, in the academic level, sort of follow Foucault, and they believe that you have to deconstruct sex and gender as sources of authority that are oppressing people. And I think Christians should push back against that. Uh, in a recent interview, Pope Francis actually talked about gender theory. It's kind of coming out of this, the idea that a child can just choose whatever gender they want, and there's such great plasticity here um, that biological sex is just as socially constructed as gender. And um, I think he's right to push back against that. Like Christians have normative teachings about sex and gender that we should be thinking about and thinking deeply and well about and teaching and understanding. But at the same time, most people who are gender dysphoric are not trying to deconstruct norms regarding sex and gender. They're just trying to survive. They're trying to navigate something very painful. And in the cultural wars, they could quickly become casualties. So we have to think, I think, beyond just getting the theology right into what will it look like to shepherd and walk alongside people and pastor people and walk with them well. Of course, that begins with good theology. Um, so, what, just to go back to Pope Francis for a second, he makes this distinction then between gender theory and walking alongside people. And you have to know when to critically evaluate ideology and when to walk with people. 
And the church, when it's at its best, does both. So he says, um, it's not something that you say, let's go party, I'm this way. He's, you know, you're not embracing it like the diversity lens and say, celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. He says, in every case where it exists, I accompany it, I study it, I discern it, I integrate it, because that's what Jesus would do. So he's saying, don't say that the Pope is pro this. He's saying, don't celebrate it, but accompany it, discern it, walk with the person. And then, of course, I think we also have to wrestle with the, you know, not just um, what does it look like from creation, fall, redemption, but also glorification. Oliver O'Donovan talks about this a little bit in, the es- in terms of the eschaton, says that maleness and femaleness forever defines an important aspect of relationship that Christ has to all of us, his church. How our individual gender identities will play out in the eschaton is not revealed, but God wants us to forever think of our relationship with Jesus through a monogamous male-female relational ana- analogy. That there's something to that that the Christian church does teach. So we want to keep that in view, and I think that's reflected in some of the teaching of the integrity lens. And theologically, that would resonate with me. But the question in part is, what do we do with that today? If that's what we're moving towards, what do we do with it today? In the time between the time, the times as Oscar Kuhlman talks about it. I think most of us are pretty uncomfortable with gender atypicality. When people live and relate in gender atypical ways, we wonder about that. Um, When you meet someone who's transsexual, who's adopted a cross-gender identity, we're uncomfortable with that. Um, I think of it like in the iceberg analogy, where so much of the iceberg is beneath the surface and so little of it is above the surface. I think of gender atypical expressions as the thing you see above the surface. And I encourage Christians to not react so strongly to what's above the surface. If you want to minister well in a rapidly changing culture, you don't react to what's above the surface you minister to what resides beneath the surface. And so much of the person navigating gender dysphoria is underneath the surface. What's underneath the surface? Questions about identity, a longing for community, hurts and disappointments, spiritual questions. Can I be saved? Can I have a walk with Christ? Communal questions, am I wanted here? They go to youth group and wonder, would I be welcomed here in your church, in your school? We did a study a few years ago, the first of its kind of transgender Christians, and we asked them, what kind of support would you have liked from the church? Can I just read one answer? One person said, someone to cry with me, someone to cry with me rather than just denounce me. Hey, it's scary to see someone not rescue someone from cancer or schizophrenia or gender dysphoria, but learn to allow your compassion to overcome your fear and repulsion. In a more recent study, we've been interviewing younger Christians who are transgender, and I just asked them, what advice would you even give to churches or pastors or youth pastors? What what advice would you give them? And one person said, don't say... God doesn't make mistakes. Um, It's like telling me you're a mistake because this dysphoria is real, right? The biggest thing is accepting me and that sin entered the world and that things happen. It isn't any less real than kids born with Down syndrome or ADHD just by loving people and accepting people. And now I can figure out how to do this. Say to them, I love you. God loves you. I'll help you walk through this in a godly way. I do think we would do well to explore a little bit more here a theology of disability, more about redemptive suffering, a theology of suffering and redemptive meaning to help people with the redemption towards glorification part. So I'm going to read one last quote here. This is from Melinda Selmus. She's a friend of mine who also experiences gender dysphoria. She's very, uh, she's a writer and uh, I think you'll appreciate 
the way she talks about this, but she says about suffering, she says, suffering in Christianity is not only not meaningless, it is ultimately one of the most powerful media for the transmission of meaning. We can stand in adoration between the cross and kneel and kiss the wood that bore the body of our Savior, because this is the means by which the ugly, meaningless, atheistic suffering of the world, the problem of evil, was transmuted into the living water, the blood of Christ, the wellspring of creation. The great paradox here is that the tree of death and suffering is the tree of life. This central paradox in Christianity allows us to love our own brokenness precisely because it's through that brokenness that we image the broken body of our God. And the highest expression of divine love, that God in some sense wills it to be so, seems evident in Gethsemane. Christ prays, not my will, but thine be done. And when God's will is done, it involves the scourge and the nails. It also always struck me as particularly fitting again, as someone suffering from gender dysphoria. It always struck me as particularly fitting and beautiful that when Christ is resurrected, his body is not returned to a state of perfection as the body of Adam and Eden, but rather it still bears the marks of his suffering and death. And indeed, that is precisely through these marks that he is known by Thomas. Friends, ours is a rapidly changing culture. The church has witnessed a shift in how the culture has viewed this topic in just a few years. From at one time thinking primarily as something closer to sin, to mental illness, to a culture to be celebrated, what you see is the Christian church trying to get its bearings on a changing culture in an area they never thought they would ever be defending or understanding or ministering to. So when we think about gender dysphoria, we would be wise to distinguish like gender theory or that strong form of the diversity lens that sees biblical teaching as a source of oppression. We have to distinguish that, engage that, and distinguish it from people like Melinda, who I just read, or the seminary graduate that I introduced you to at the beginning. We're at our best as a church when we come alongside people who are navigating gender identity concerns. When we say clearly to them, I'm glad you're here. There's no other place I'd want you to be. When they're asking, do you want me here? We answer with a resounding yes. We want you here. When we come alongside people navigating gender identity concerns and when we adopt a posture of humility about what we know and what we do not know, when we accept the reality of it, when we accompany it, and when we discern it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this group of students, staff and faculty, and I thank you for this college. Thank you for our heart's desire to discern your will and to follow you, to love people well. Give us wisdom. Give us discernment as we engage some of the most challenging topics of our day to find a way forward that is biblically faithful, that is merciful, that is gracious, recognizing the marks of suffering developing perhaps a greater theology of disability, an understanding of redemption. We ask for your blessing on students who may be navigating gender identity in their own lives, questions that may be coming up for them. We're glad that they're here. Would you help us now to love one another well, to serve and honor you? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sing the doxology. Praise God for.